Now that we are well into fall and winter is quickly approaching, the days are getting shorter and running in daylight is becoming harder. Wazelle's premium reflective collection is designed with runner safety in mind. Both highly visible in the dark but subtle in the daytime, thanks to the tonal reflective print that only shines bright when reflecting the light. From tight shorts, jackets, and tanks to accessories like hats and gloves, with Wazelle's reflective collection, you can stay safe and stay seen. It is dark here in Cleveland where I've been running, so I just love Wazelle's reflective collection. I'm a big fan of the firecracker tights. The bird pattern is so cute, and they look all over sparkly at night. To check out the firecracker tights and the rest of the reflective collection, go to wazelle.com slash collection slash reflective, or even easier, click the banner link at the top of the Hear Her Sports website at hearhersports.com. Well, hello and happy winter. This is Hear Her Sports, the podcast of long form, intimate profiles of female athletes breaking boundaries, speaking up and living with power and confidence. I am your host, Elizabeth Emery. Thank you so much for being here. Today's guest is a sports journalist at the New York Times, Talia Minsberg. We recorded the conversation many weeks ago. The article I mentioned in the introduction as her most recent is no longer her most recent. Since then, one of the articles she's written is about building mental toughness like the pros, which she also talks about here. I'd love to hear your thoughts about Drive, which I've been thinking about since this conversation. Email Elizabeth at hearhersports.com or message me on social at hearhersports. Well, time to meet Talia. It's really exciting to have Talia Minsberg, the assistant editor of strategy at New York Times Sports. Talia previously worked as an editor on New York Times social team and for special projects. During that time, among other things, she spearheaded the newsroom's social coverage at the Pyeongchang Olympics. She writes about a range of men's and women's sports. Her most recent article was about Brianna Stewart, the WNBA, and the work players have been doing for social justice and to get out the vote. Talia is a runner and a surfer. Welcome, Talia. It's really a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Sure. You know, I want to start just finding out a little bit more of what you do day to day or week to week or whatever your kind of schedule is on. And feel free to make any sort of distinctions about now and pre-pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. Well, things have definitely gotten a bit more interesting, I would say, in the past handful of months. I told the head of the sports department at the New York Times, Randy Archibald, that I'll never forget what he said on, I believe it was Thursday, March 12th. And, you know, it was the very beginning of what we would soon come to understand as this months long pandemic. But he said, you know, folks, I I think we have to ready ourselves for a world in which there are no sports. And I don't know what my next sentence is. And that was like part of his, you know, preparation. And Within a few weeks, that was the reality. I mean, a lot of sporting events started falling. At the beginning, I think there was a lot of hope that, you know, maybe by the summer, maybe there could be the Olympics, maybe there could be some, you know, the college football season at least, or, you know, major marathons. And one by one, things kept dropping. Uh, And so it's been a really, really interesting time to work on the sports desk in a world where athletes, just like everyone else, have to fundamentally change how they how they go about their day-to-day lives. And we have changed how we look at athletes and, and tell their stories. So rewind to a year ago or so, I would say most of my work is thinking about our audience, thinking about the kinds of stories we are telling, the kinds of stories we want to tell, looking at what our audience is looking for and maybe stories that they don't even know are out there. And that includes you know, doing everything from looking into data to looking into trends, doing some editing, just, you know, looking at features and, and working directly with the reporters and then doing some reporting myself. So I'm, I'm quite lucky to wear a handful of hats and have a handful of responsibilities in this role. So I'm, I'm really enjoying it. Well, that's great. You mentioned a whole bunch of things that I want to talk about. I mean, what kind of trends have you seen? And you mentioned the stories that you're trying to tell now that, you know, sports are so different. And one of the things I've noticed on the podcast is, you know, it's hard to talk to athletes about the competitions they have coming up because there's nothing coming up. And mm-hmm. anything coming up is, you know, who knows when it's coming up. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's It's been really interesting. I think a lot of folks are learning from professional athletes and the mental strategies they have to employ, both in competition and in day-to-day life now. I've always said... One of the things I love about running and love about being an endurance 
athlete, a marathon runner, is that at mile five, if you have a stomach cramp, you cannot think about mile 20. You just have to get through mile five. You start thinking about mile 20, you're going to go nuts. And I think a lot of athletes have that mentality professionally, amateur as well. So I think a lot of ordinary folks have looked to the lessons that athletes have in terms of mental toughness, of resilience, of staying present in the moment that you're in, you know, to to get through this time. And I think that's been something we've heard from a lot of athletes as we interview them. And that's something that we've heard a lot from our readers, that that is something they like to hear. It's also, I think, this moment of everyone's in the same boat. It's stars. They're just like us. Professional athletes, they're just like us. And so it's been really interesting to to see that both from the professional athlete's point of view and from our reader's point of view. And you're a runner, so you've still been running. Yes. And how has that been for you and has it changed? I mean, like your attitude about it, has it changed? I've always been so, so very grateful to call running one of my greatest loves. It's something I've loved to do since I was a little kid. And I feel very lucky that I have this hobby that I can do pretty much anytime, anywhere. So it's definitely something I've had a lot of gratitude towards for my whole life, but I would say especially now when it's really one of the only forms of exercise that you can do safely. I mean, especially in the earlier months living in Brooklyn, no one was really doing anything. If you were getting out of the house, you were doing minimal grocery store trips or going for a walk, and that was about it. So to have an outlet like running has really just been a huge lifesaver and a huge mental break from the day to day. And and I actually wrote an article, again, near the beginning of the pandemic about how suddenly everyone was becoming a runner because it's one of the more accessible forms of exercise. And it's really been a gift to have in a time where social distancing is, is the norm and, and figuring out a way to exercise, whether it's walking or running, and to do so safely can be very beneficial, both physically and mentally. One of the things, because I am I run as well, and one of the things I've discovered is that I really like running, I think in part because it's like running away or running to something or mm-hmm. running from something. Have you experienced that? Definitely. I think that some of my time on the run is the best brainstorming I'll do. Some of it is, you know, if I'm unbelievably stressed by whatever life has thrown at me, it can very much be an escape. And even if it's not so much running away from it, it can just be a complete mental break. Again, I would say the mentality of being present in the mile you're in or the repetition you're in can be really huge. I think, you know, when if I'm doing a track workout or or a threshold workout and my legs are on fire and my lungs are on fire, you can't possibly think of your work deadlines or, or the news or Anything really besides, okay, just get to the end of this repetition or get to the end of this mile. And so that has been something that's really helpful for me as someone that absolutely can get caught up in anxiety and and a lot of the, the feelings of existing as a human in 2020 and period. So it's, again, something I'm really, really grateful for. Yeah. How are you training and how have you changed your training? I'm assuming you're still, are you training? Do you think of it as training? (laughs) Kind of, yeah. I mean, it's funny you say that because I I just decided to do the the New York City Marathon virtually. And I decided to do it a bit ago. And I realized, like, I'm not really doing the same kind of threshold workouts or the same kind of track workouts. But I love doing long runs on the weekends. And I might as well. So, you know, I'm, I'm kind of training. It's been a different experience in that I'm much more lax. You know, I'm not like, oh, I have to make sure I get this workout done on this day. And if my pace isn't X, Y, and Z, I'm going to be really bummed. It's just having the pressure taken off a little bit is totally different. So I'm, I'm like light training, but I'm, I'm very happy to be doing it. Yeah. Have you been able to take advantage of the break, you know, sort of making up for injuries or anything like that? Yeah. Well, I felt really guilty at the beginning of this. I felt like the only runner who was grateful that Boston was postponed initially because I was injured at the beginning of the year. I had, what was it? It was something with my hip that I'm forgetting the name of. And I had to be off my feet for six weeks, which was excruciating for me as someone that likes to run most days of the week. And so I I was mentally getting ready to do Boston with very little training. When it was postponed, I was like, oh my God, I, I hit a jackpot because I can now be trained and ready to do it in September. 
of course, that did not happen, but it, it did give me time to slowly work back to where I was at the end of 2019. Has there been anything that has surprised you, I guess, in the last seven months that you've learned from the athletes that you've spoken to or any of the women in sports or people in sports that you've spoken to? I think I've always been impressed by athletes who really put advocacy in the front and center of their athleticism and the front and center of what it means to be a a public figure. I think that has only multiplied tenfold. I was really, really taken aback. I wouldn't say surprised because this is the kind of work we've seen a lot of athletes doing, but the way in which the WNBA and the NBA in particular took action in the bubble and in the wobble was really, it was really a powerful thing. And I think it really speaks to collective organizing and to what it looks like when not only an individual or a team, but a league gets on the same page. And it's been really something to watch. I've been super excited about how, as you said, leagues or teams have gotten together and have united and have understood their power as a group. You know, the, mm-hmm. you know soccer certainly is an example in WNBA and NBA, but also, you know, hockey has been an example, the women's hockey team. Mm-hmm. It's really exciting right now. Absolutely. And I think a lot of athletes are kind of putting their hands up in the air and saying, yeah, finally, like, we're glad you're paying attention. Welcome. Like, come join us. Come follow us. Come see what we're all about. I think that's especially true for female athletes, that there's a lot of like nodding and being like, yep, you know, we, a lot of us, especially the WNBA, they've been doing this work for a while. And I think they perhaps are doing it before it was as in vogue as it is now. Right. So, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, sort of on that same topic, what has your experience been in the sports newsroom Mm -hmm. as a woman? And you're one of the few. So it's actually been, I got to say, a very positive experience for me. I am really lucky to to work with so many colleagues I very much admire. You know, one thing that's hard about work from home being remote is that, of course, there's collaboration digitally, there's Slack, there's Hangouts, there's Zoom, there's, you know, you name it. But I think a lot of what I really, really love about working in a newsroom like the Times is that there's a lot of collaboration. You know, you'll go over to someone's desk and say, hey, did you see this? Did you hear about this? Let's, you know, brainstorm an idea. Is this worth a story? What kind of story? Who's the best person to tell it? What's the best way to get into the story? And and that's something I really miss right now. But it's a very collaborative environment. And it's one that's very encouraging of trying new things. And and what I mean by that is not just, you know, the standard 800, 1,000 word article with one photo up top. I think the Times is right now especially very committed to experimenting in different kinds of storytelling, and that's something that's especially exciting for me at the Times. Do you feel excited to be part of sort of a history of women's sports writers and to be part of moving the needle for more women to be involved, or are you aware of that at all? Yeah, absolutely. Look, I mean, I know that female journalists in sports departments are are few and far between. I feel very lucky to be in a newsroom where I'm not the only woman on the sports desk and there are a handful of us and that's wonderful. But you know, it's true that we're still the minority and I stand on the shoulders of a lot of my predecessors and I'm very aware of that and very grateful for the path they've paved. And I know there's a lot of work to be done. One of the reasons that I started this podcast is because I saw the stat that 44% of athletes were women and only 4% of sports media coverage was about women. Mm-hmm. You know, what's it like when you're presenting stories about women athletes or women's sports or anything like that? And, you know, like what happens when you present that? I mean, I've read stories about in the past, female journalists coming to their editor and the editor's like, no one wants to read that. I would mm-hmm. hope to think that that's not quite the same anymore. Yeah, I would really say it's not. I feel, again, very lucky. I can only speak to my experience, my personal experience at the New York Times since I've been there and since I've been on the sports desk. But I can very much say that that has not been my experience at all. In fact, I think there's been a very dedicated push to make sure that we are covering a lot of female athletes and a lot of women's leagues. I think, you know, the Women's World Cup last year, we put an enormous amount of resources into just as we should. That's not something that I think, you know, we should get a pat on the back for. It is news and it should be covered as such. And those athletes are incredible and they should be covered as such. The same is true with the WNBA, this year's Wobble, which I love that we call it the Wobble. You know, we covered that really extensively. And I think that 
again, this is not a, we should get a cookie or a medal or a pat on the back. It should very much be the norm, but I do feel lucky that that is the expectation that this is news. These are athletes we should be covering and period. Right. What are your goals at the times personally, but also, you know, like what would you like to see improve in sports journalism? That's a great question. It's one that I think I am still kind of exploring day to day. I really like a lot of feature stories and feature writing. I'm really interested in what drives athletes. So I've been really driven myself to understand what makes the greatest athletes in the world, the greatest athletes in the world. And and by that, I mean, not, you know, Michael Phelps trained in this way and eats this. Of course, that's really interesting to me as someone that's a sports fan, but what what really drives athletes to get to a level of greatness? Um, so I think exploring those questions more deeply is something that's really interesting to me. But beyond that, I would say the stories that I think are most profound and find the most interesting and diverse audience and diverse in every sense of the word is a story that explores sports at the intersection of society. So, you know, this notion of shut up and dribble is is so antiquated, in my opinion, because, you know, these professional athletes are public figures. And what do we see at the intersection of sports and society, sports and race, sports and gender, sports and geopolitics, sports and, you know, socioeconomic status? I think there are a lot of really interesting stories to tell about individuals and leagues that have yet to be told. And I think there's a lot to learn. I know personally... As an athlete, a kid that grew up doing every sport in the book, and as a sports fan now, I think there's a lot to be learned as both an athlete and a a fan. And I think that we as journalists have the profound and and pretty exciting opportunity to tell those stories and share, share some of those lessons. It's pretty amazing how since the pandemic, the shift of the kind of thing that you're talking about, that, you know, the stories being told are so different now, it seems to me. I mean, in part because out of necessity, but in part just I think people are realizing that this is a really interesting aspect of sports. Absolutely. Absolutely. I would agree. And I think that audience is only growing. Yeah. Especially as we have very international audiences, not just at the New York Times, but the way we consume media has shifted so dramatically. You know, I was visiting family friends in Jerusalem and they were ecstatic when, you know, I was talking to their neighbors and this neighbor kid of theirs, this like 12 year old kid was saying, I love the Brooklyn Nets and here are all of my favorite players and all the statistics that I know. And oh my gosh, you live by the Brooklyn Nets, like home stadium. That's so cool. And I was like, you know, two dozen years ago, I think it would be a little harder to be a Brooklyn Nets fan who could list, first of all, Brooklyn Nets didn't exist, but, you know, being a fan of an NBA team and being able to list off their stats across the world. You mentioned really being interested in athletes' drive to success. What have, like, what have you learned about that? I think more than anything, what I learn over and over again is it's a lot of mental strength. You really have to want whatever you're going after, whether that's a personal record, whether that's making a professional team, whether that's making a varsity team, there has to be this inner drive. You know, one thing I saw growing up, I I ran track and I was on this like club team, this inner city club team. And I tell my parents, one of the greatest gifts they gave me was never pressuring my sister and I in any way. We just, we loved running. And so they always said, you know, cool, if you like it and you're having fun, we'll support you. We'll like get you to practice and all that stuff. But I remember kids my age who had parents who were very invested in their success in a way that took that intrinsic drive away from the kid. And the drive was more on behalf of the parents. The parents wanted to see their kids succeed. And I think having this internal drive is so important. And something I very much see in most professional athletes I've interviewed You know, of course, there's natural talent, there's natural ability, and then there's that that you build upon. But I think it's the mental strength and fortitude and an inner drive that comes from somewhere that that can't really be taught that really propels athletes because it's it's not always glamorous. You know, I think that's the other thing you learn the more time you spend in the sports world. It's it's easy to look at a professional athlete's Instagram page and see how cool their life looks. They're training their butts off, and so there's got to be there's got to be a real drive that comes from deep within. 
Do you have a sense of where that drive comes from? I mean, are they working on it? Or do you think that it's just sort of this genetic thing that, or maybe nurture thing <laughs> that happened when they were young? That's a good question. I do think it's a little of both. I think sometimes it's this, you know, where does this desire for competition come from? And I'm not quite sure all the time. You know, I can be kind of competitive. My sister is very competitive. We're competitive with each other. I don't really know why, you know, I don't know. Sometimes I think like, is that an interesting sibling thing? Like if I was an only child, would I be just as competitive? Is it just because we're both like kind of like to push each other's buttons? So I don't know. I do think it's a little nature, a little nurture. I think there also is something to be said for someone who recognizes potential and then fuels that. So if it's someone that sees a young athlete playing soccer and says like, if you work on this, you have real potential. Is that something that a young kid or a young athlete hears and really keeps that within them and that pushes them? And then I also think there's a lot to be said for the benefits that can come with being a professional athlete. If your path to college is getting a scholarship, that can be a really big motivator. If your path to financial success is becoming a professional athlete, that too can be a big motivator. So I really think it is dependent on on a handful of things, nature and nurture, and also what it means to be a collegiate athlete, to be a professional athlete, and what your personal goals are in that sense. And now just a quick break to say that Hear Her Sports is now an affiliate of Bookshop, an online bookstore supporting local independent bookstores. When you order books from hearhersports.com forward slash books, we get a small percentage of the total sale. We put together a fun list of books recommended by our guests, written by our guests, or related to an episode. But there's no need to stick to the list once you're on Hear Her Sports store page. All of your purchases support the show, and we will thank you very much. That website again is hearhersports.com forward slash books. One of the things that I've been thinking about during the pandemic is why are sports important? Like, why do we even care right now? I mean, there's so much stuff, turmoil, whatever you want to call it going on right now. Like, who cares? Mm -hmm. But of course I do care. (laughs) So I'm curious what your thoughts are about, you know, why sports are in fact important right now. Yeah. Well, I think one thing that I feel like a lot of people are really missing right now is a sense of community and that can mean one of a hundred things. It can mean, you know, the community you feel in your neighborhood, at your office, at the gym, at your local coffee shop where you usually go. I also think there's a lot to be said for a community that forms around teams. That could be, you know, a a pick-me-up basketball game, or that can be an NFL game, or that can be a collegiate match. There's something that really brings people together in a way that you know, you can have everything in the world. You can meet someone and your lives can be completely opposite. But if you're going for the same team, you share something. And if you're on the same team, if you're playing, you share something too. You're going for the same goal. But I've always thought that, you know, I think about this a lot for big events like the Super Bowl, but then also things like going to a marathon. It's just, it makes you believe in humanity when people are, cheering for the same thing. And everyone knows it's, you know, it's for fun, but everyone's cheering for the same thing. And I think that's something that we can kind of lose sight of, especially right now in the climate we're currently living in. And I think it's something people really miss. At the same time, I would say, you know, it's entertainment. Like I went to the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I had so much fun at Big Ten football games. And so, of course, I wanted the Badgers to win, but you know, would we have that much less fun if they lost? Probably not. It's a really, there's also something to be said for sports as entertainment. And I think that's also something that people are missing right now. Have you seen any good to all of this disruption and the pandemic for athletes and sports? Hmm. I would say that everyone has gained a lot of perspective, even if sometimes gaining perspective is not the most fun experience. I think that Every athlete I've spoken to who has gone back to play, so that's mostly WNBA players, there is just such a sense of gratitude because you know what it's like to have it taken away. And this isn't a you know what it's like to have it taken away as an injury. You know what it's like to have your entire league 
gone, your entire season gone. And I think that being able to play and to compete again at whatever level is such a gift and such a a wonderful experience. And I think that has been strengthened furthermore here. I think of how emotional I'll be when I am able to line up at a marathon again. Like I cannot wait. And I know exactly how profound that will feel because we know what it's like when it's not here. So I think that real sense of, of gratitude is something that we've all gained. And I think there's also, you know, this persistence. We've all had to learn a different kind of resilience during this time. We don't have a finish line. And I think that resilience is something that athletes will really carry. And back to the newsroom, like, how are you guys preparing for the shift in sports once the pandemic is over? Or are you even thinking about that? Like, how are you planning for anything? We've actually had to do a bit of experimenting, or not not so much experimenting, shifting around. I mean, a few weeks ago, we went from having no sports to having, we had NBA games, WNBA games, MLB, NFL, and college football all at once, and tennis and golf. And it was, it was a madhouse. And it was this extreme shift from what felt like nothing to what felt like everything. We are a very adaptable newsroom. And so we've kind of just started to roll the punches as much as we can. And I think we'll continue to do so. I think we are definitely all eager to get back to the newsroom, but we're only going to do so when it's safe. So until then, I think it's just as the sports world continues shifting and adapting, we're going to to have to continue to do so as we continue to work virtually. Is there anything in particular that you're looking forward to in 2021? I really, really hope that my answer is the Olympics. So I would love to see the Olympics go forward if it is able to do so safely. Um, and if all athletes and, and press and fans are able to attend in a way that's safe for everyone. But I love the Olympics. There are so many extraordinary stories to be told there. So that's something I really am looking forward to with some crossed fingers and cautious optimism. Are you guys preparing, like, are are you already set on the kind of stories that you're thinking about? And, you know, when the Olympics get announced as going ahead, you just are all ready? Or are you waiting to hear what happens? You know, I'm not exactly sure. I think there are a lot of moving pieces. We're always brainstorming different kinds of story ideas for different sports and, and different scenarios. I think like the rest of the world, we're, of course, in a little bit of a wait and see pattern, but I know there are a lot of balls in the air. I mean, some of the sports have already been selected, but there are plenty mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. the team isn't even known yet. Yeah. one The last time I traveled actually was in the, again, before times was for the U.S. Marathon Olympic trials. So that team was set like uh, two weeks before the country shut down. Right. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you think that there are going to be changes in the way that we look at sports after the pandemic? Once everything gets sort of back to normal, will there be changes as a result of the pandemic? That's a good question. I think that the way in which athletes have used their platform during the pandemic has changed the way that many will look at athletes as voices of change. I do think that you know, it still is kind of extraordinary to me to see the NFL running advertisements about racial inequality and systemic racism. It, it, it feels radical to say out loud, this is the NFL we're talking about. So I do think that there is more of an expectation that athletes and leagues are going to take stands on different issues because when everyone was watching in 2020, it slowly but surely became more of the norm. So I do wonder if that's something that will continue in the months and the years to come. Are there any sports that you particularly follow? I know that you're a surfer. Yeah, I love I, I love following the running world. I love watching surfing. The World Surf League has these awesome live streams that are really fun to follow. And sometimes in the dead of winter in New York, I'll you know put it up on my screen and people will walk by my desk and they're like, what are you watching? Like, oh, this is a great, you know, professional surfers in Fiji. I'm getting drone footage here on my second screen. So that's something that's very fun to follow, but nothing replicates seeing that in real life. So I'm a big fan of professional surfing, and I'm really excited to see some of the new sports at the Olympics. 
uh, including rock climbing and skateboarding. So those are two of the the sports that will be making their Olympic debut. And those are ones I'm, I'm really excited to follow. Yeah, I'm really excited about this as well. Do you have any great fangirl stories? Ooh, yes. I have a really good one from... I was new at the New York Times. I want to say this is maybe 2012. And I saw one of my colleagues walking through the New York Times with one of my favorite surfers. And it was just this total moment of, is like, is that who I think it is? And her name is Carissa Moore. She's an incredible Hawaiian surfer, one of the best in the world. And I was in a meeting and I got out of the meeting. <laughs> like I jumped out and I was like, I'll be right back. And I ran up to her and I was like, oh my God, what are you doing here? And she, this was earlier in her career before she was, so this was eight years ago. Now she's very much a household name, but she wasn't as much of a household name at the time. And I think it was one of the first times she had been recognized. So she was excited and I was excited and her parents were there and they were excited. So it was this very sweet moment of us all kind of fangirling through the moment. And she was awesome. And she, it was it was really fun to meet her. Do you meet a lot of athletes? I mean, in person or is it mostly over the phone? Yeah, I would say in the in the air quote before times. I, I would meet a lot of athletes, whether it's meeting them before or after an event, whether it's them coming through to the office, whether it's at, you know, some sort of summit. So I have had the privilege of meeting lots of really incredible athletes in person. How did you get started at the Times? And did you always know that you wanted to be in sports journalism? Well, I'll answer the second part of the question, which is no. I thought I wanted to be a sports medicine doctor. I was convinced when I was in high school I had a bunch of running injuries and all these sports meds docs fixed me right up. And it's like, that's what I want to do. And then freshman year chemistry happened. And I kind of rethought that a bit. So I kind of stumbled into sports journalism, but I started at the Times as a community moderator. So I started, I was very interested in journalism, period, especially in sports journalism. So when I started, I was working on the greater news desk. So working across articles on both the newsroom and the opinion side. Since I began at the Times, I kind of raised my hand to do whatever I could to help the sports desk. I had the interesting position of being one of the only people in the newsroom who knew a good amount about surfing. There were a few of us little scattered across the newsroom who would always kind of nudge the sports department. Hey, there's this interesting thing happening in the sports world, in the surfing world. You know, we should write about it. We should do something about it. So I started also working with the sports desk while I was on the community desk. And as my career progressed, I did more and more projects with the sports desk, both when I was on the social team, uh, when I was on the special projects team, and then eventually made the move full time to work on sports. And it's been a really fantastic experience. Do you have advice for other people that might be interested in that kind of career? Yeah, I think, you know, one of my very first uh, managers at the Times, her name is Sasha, and she said to me, she was like, Talia, you need to find your rabbi, which was such a good quote. But she was just like, you need to find someone in the newsroom or your workplace that will help mentor you, that will kind of be like your spiritual advisor. And when you have ideas or questions or whatever, you feel comfortable going to them and, and discussing it. And it was such a good piece of advice. And it's something I, I give to a lot of young journalists to find your rabbi, to find your mentor. As a young journalist, learning how to communicate in this big bureaucratic environment, you know, you want to make sure that if you have an idea, where do I even start with an idea? Who do I go to? Having that rabbi or that mentor can be a good person to help guide you. That is one of the number one pieces of advice I give. And I credit to my one of my wonderful managers, Sasha. That's awesome. You mentioned surfing. And what is it like to present stories about sports that are sort of more fringe. And, you know, I'm an endurance athlete. And so, you know, I think about cross-country skiing. I think about cycling, you know, surfing. I don't know. There's plenty of sports that, that don't get a ton of coverage. Yeah. It's, I think you really have to bring your fellow editors and reporters into the story the same way you would bring readers into the story. So, you know, I think about a sport that I don't have much interest in and think about the things that would make me more interested. And it's got to be a good story. I think it's just thinking about the method of storytelling and what the hook is for someone that doesn't know anything about the sport. So, you know, when I'm working with a reporter who has written a ton 
about whatever sport we're writing about. So say it's surfing and let's say she's written a ton about surfing, which is great. We want that context, but I always, you know, have a discussion and we say like, let's take it a few steps back and make sure that if someone has never read an article about surfing, has never heard of the surfer, has never watched a surfing competition, like what can we say that will bring them into the story and keep them engaged? So I think it's a lot about storytelling with your editors and reporters in the same way it is with your readers, finding those finding those human elements that really transcend whatever sport you're writing about. Are there any athletes that you're particularly interested in following that you really super admire and you follow no matter what and they, I don't know, inspire you? Hmm. That's a great question. I feel like there are a handful. I can say one athlete that was particularly exciting in the last Olympics was Jesse Diggins and Keegan Randall, who won the the first U.S. Olympic gold in cross-country skiing. And I'm, I think it was the first gold ever, if I'm not mistaken, and the first medal in what, like 42 yeah. years. And Jesse Diggins is almost exactly my age and also grew up in Minnesota. And so she's someone that I remember seeing her name in the paper when I was younger, you know, this up and coming cross country skier. I think there's always something fun about hometown heroes. And I was at that cross country ski event in Pyeongchang, which was just unbelievable. Wow. Uh, so that's, that's, I would say those two are definitely athletes that are super exciting, but there are a lot. I think it really depends on the sport. I, I love watching a good track and field race. I'm really excited about some of the up and coming athletes that I expect to see at the track trials hopefully, as we get into 2021. Also, watching the U.S. Marathon Olympic trials was really fantastic. Yeah, that was a great race. Yeah, there are a lot of a lot of athletes to really look up to and a lot of athletes who I'm excited to follow. So in running, who are some young athletes that we should be watching in 2021 and beyond, actually? Mm. Well, I think the number one name that a lot of people have on the tip of their tongue is Molly Seidel. And she was one of the athletes to really have a breakthrough race at the U.S. Marathon Olympic Trials. She is in her mid-20s, and this was her first marathon. I think that's part of the storyline that people really, really love. So that's a young athlete that I think a lot of folks should keep an eye out for. I also think, you know, Sarah Hall, she is in her, I think she's 37. She's in her mid-30s. She is an athlete that a lot of people kind of discounted because she's older. She's 37, which is not old, but it's just, you know, the way in which we talk about age with professional athletics and professional runners is is so skewed, but she's had a few breakout performances. She just finished second at the London Marathon, and and she's expected to do the U.S. track trials this coming spring. So she's another athlete that I'm keeping a close eye on. And, and yeah, I would say those two are, are top of mind. But in terms of young athletes in the running world, I would say Molly is one of the, the big up and coming stars. Not even not up and coming. She's an Olympian. She, she already made it. But it was pretty extraordinary watching someone really have their breakthrough race in that way. I just watched the Sarah Hall sprint. Oh, in yeah. London Marathon. Oh, my gosh. That so was, everybody cool. should watch that. It was amazing. And that, that like desire we were talking about earlier, you can see it all over her face. She wants it so bad. And that was really cool to see. Yeah. Are there any issues in sports that you're interested in following? So not related to a specific athlete, but some sort of topic that you think is going to be important, that's important now or also that you think will be important in 2021? Yeah, I think there are a lot of issues. I think that, you know, there's a lot to discuss when it comes to equal pay. I think there is a lot to discuss when it comes to, you know, how systemic racism is played out in sporting events. I think one of the issues I'm really interested in is how the Olympic Committee will respond to any forms of protest at the 2021 Olympics. You know, historically, it has been a big no-no. I would kind of expect there to be some pushback from athletes, especially as we have seen the kind of social action that we have this year. Uh, So that's something I'm really interested in looking at in particular is how the IOC will shift their rules, if at all, or if there will be athletes who decide to, you know, take the risk or make some sort of statement at the Olympic Games and, and suffer whatever outcomes will follow. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that because there's sort of two things butting up against each other that will be very interesting. Exactly. And are you hopeful about equal pay? You know, the I would say I'm a eternal optimist, so I want to say yes. 
I don't think it's going to come as quickly as anyone really wants it to. But it's, it's honestly, it's hard to say. It's hard to say. I'm lucky to have a lot of colleagues who are following it very, very closely, including Andrew Das, who has written a lot about the U.S. women's national team and their fight for equal pay. But it's just that it is a fight. And so it will be interesting to see what continues to play out. It's also interesting because equal pay is hooked up with so much other mm-hmm. equity issues in sports that, mm-hmm. you know, like coaching and locker room stuff and all sorts of things. So it's a, a really interesting topic. Absolutely. And yeah, and I feel like we're just scratching the surface. Yeah. Well, before we wrap up, is there anything that I didn't get to that's important for everything that we have talked about? Mm. Oh, I guess one more thing I would say I'm very interested in is what the shift of collegiate sports will look like now that there have the rules around name and likeness have changed. I think what it means to be a collegiate athlete is about to fundamentally change. I think that is going to be a really interesting storyline to watch. I know that there are a lot of collegiate athletes that are swimmers or rugby players or lacrosse players or runners, gymnasts, who have found really strong audiences across social and and YouTube kind of thing. And I think it is going to be fascinating to see how young athletes and, and young female athletes in particular who may not have had a career route, you know, it's very hard to become a professional swimmer. There are only so many so many slots in which you can really make a a living off of that. But, you know, are we going to see a new crop of young athletes who really find a new route to becoming a professional athlete that does not look like what we previously thought as a professional athlete? Meaning, you know, is a vlogger, someone who does YouTube videos, is someone going to figure out how to become a sponsored professional athlete when they're in college and beyond because they take viewers and fans behind the scenes in a way that some of the best swimmers in the world don't. So that's something I'm really interested in and digging into in the years to come. Yeah. And I'm glad you mentioned that that's particularly important for female athletes. Mm -hmm. It sort of gives them a power of independence. Exactly. Exactly. Well, thank you so much. This has really been, it's been fun talking to you. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you so much for having me. It's, It's always fun having these conversations. Sure. I'm also glad that you're a surfer fan. Um, so yeah. That's, that's fun. Yeah. Highly cool. recommend it. It's great. If you have a sense of wanderlust, it's a great thing to turn on. Yeah. Do you have any plans to travel anytime soon? Ugh, I, ho- I sure <laughs> hope so. I sure hope so. I can't wait. I, I did get on a plane for the first time a few weeks ago to see family and it was a whole, you know, I quarantined, I got tested, la la la. But I'm very excited to travel when quarantining and testing is not part of the the landing procedure. So so we will see. I'm trying to be as patient as possible and and, and wait until all the authorities give us a, a green light. And God, I just can't wait. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Well, well thanks again. Thank you so much. Talia is so right. These conversations are always fun. I appreciate her making the time to be on Hear Her Sports and give us some heads up on what we can look forward to in 2021. As always, find links to things we talked about in the episode in show notes at hearhersports.com. In this case, there are links to some of Talia's writings and the athletes she mentioned. And I'm thrilled to be able to highlight Sarah Hall's absolutely stunning finish at the socially distanced 2020 London Marathon. I've linked a short highlight, but watching the whole race is fun to see how she got there. Talia recommended a book, which I can't wait to read. A link to that is also in the show notes or go directly to our shop page at hearhersports.com books. Every purchase you make starting from our shop page supports the podcast. So thank you in advance. Stay up to date on upcoming episodes by subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Overcast, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. While 44% of athletes are women, Only 4% of the media coverage is about women. Hear Her Sports aims to shift the scale while inspiring women to be their best. Until next time, bye-bye. Well, actually, wait, hold on. My window guy is right here, so let me be right where I'm back. Have you ever wanted to know how to win a Formula One Grand Prix? I mean, really know. Know about the driver tactics from the cockpit, the strategy calls from the pit wall, and even the mind games in the paddock. 
There's a lot more that goes into winning a Grand Prix than just 90 minutes of racing. So every week on the F1 Strategy Report, we're taking a deep dive into the decisions that shape every result. Hey there, my name is Michael Laminato, and every week I'm joined by an expert guest from the paddock to talk through the big calls that won the race and the missteps that resulted in bitter defeat. Before every race, we'll look back at the previous year's result and consult the current form guide, and we'll be in your feed after every Grand Prix, dissecting the outcome and what it means for the championship. So for your regular hit of Formula One analysis, subscribe to the F1 Strategy Report wherever you get your favourite podcasts. The Strategy Report is a beer mogul podcast on the Evergreen Podcasts Network. My name's Michael Laminato, and I'll catch you after the chequered flag.